The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. So we uh, come down to our very last presentation, which is going to be given by Professor Jack Maley from UC Berkeley. And as he mentioned um, in the first session, he uh, uh, co-organized this session with me. So I also take this opportunity to thank him for his help in uh, the organization of this session. So, Great. Thanks, Gustavo. It's a real pleasure to, to be here today and to have a chance to, to, to speak to you and, and hold you for a few more minutes, and we'll see if we can't get out of here a little early today. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to, to spend a little time with Roland Sharp. So I spent some time talking with uh, Roland, and uh, he remembers the time very well, and it was for him a wonderful time uh, to be working in the earthquake engineering field. And he relayed a lot of uh, interesting things to me. You know, he, he said uh, at the time that Meta and he uh, are the only two survivors, and I think that's correct, the only two survivors who, uh, whose names are shown up here. Uh, and Roland recalls it as a time when we were young and frisky and had lots of energy. I, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't there then. Uh, Roland gives a little bit of his own history, which is kind of interesting to, to hear. Uh, he, he says he joined John Bloom Associates as an engineer in 1950. Uh, in the mid-1950s, uh, the Air Force retained Bloom and uh, Roland uh, and others at Bloom's company, I'm sure, to consult on seismic and explosive effects on underground concrete missile silos. And uh, Professor Newmark was a senior consultant and was in charge of uh, the various meetings uh, that were held at the time. And according to Rowland, uh, in that period uh, was when uh, he really developed a, a close relationship working with uh, uh, Nate Newmark, uh, leading to really lifetime friendships and cooperation among the, the three of them, as, as Rowland recalls it, uh, uh, Newmark. Bloom and Sharp. Uh, in any case, uh, Roland has a few other interesting stories he tells, and then I'll, I'll move on with my own presentation here. Uh, in 1957 through 1958, uh, he was serving as a consultant to an architect engineering firm in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And the, the subject of the consulting was a 24-story reinforced concrete moment-resisting frame. Uh, whose dimensions just so happen to exactly match the dimensions of the 24-story frame that's in the Bloom, Newmark, and Corning book. Uh, he, he says uh, that uh, the building was constructed of reinforced concrete at the time because structural steel would have had to have been imported at great expense. And so they wanted to do this out of reinforced concrete, and so they did. Uh, the analyses of the building are summarized in Chapter 7, of, of that book over there. Um, according to Rowland, there were various uh, ongoing discussions uh, at the time about high-rise concrete buildings among several of the participants and, and other engineers working in the field at the time. At some point, and, and this bit of history is a little lost, uh, PCA asked them to write the book. And uh, there were, Meta has his, his own humble view of, of who was working on this. But uh, Rollins says that's the nine guys who worked on it. Um, according to him, 
uh, the writing was mostly done by the subor subordinates, as was the style in those days, uh, but with lots of input from the bosses. And they worked back and forth for maybe a couple years until they were more or less satisfied with the result. And the rest is kind of history. And so, anyway, this is a, a copy of the, the book uh, on the left that comes in a, a special box, a binder, uh, that I, I happen to have at home. On the right-hand side is what you can find, I understand, in nine copies of the book. That if you open up on the signature page, you can find the nine signatures. And, of course, you can go to PCA and, and buy the yellow book. But to get something like this, you either have to know one of these guys or uh, you have to go to eBay and be really lucky. Uh, and Ken Elward, who was one of my students, went to eBay on my recommendation and, and bought this copy of the book for nine U.S. dollars. And he called me up. He says, you'll never believe what I got. So he got one of the nine. It says, in mutual appreciation of the sincere cooperation in the preparation of this book, and it's Bloom with Sexton and Sharp, uh, Newmark, Cease and Sozin, Corning, Parman, Sparunas. And Meta, you can... Uh, claim this is correct or incorrect, I don't know. This is what Roland Sharp tells me. Anyway, being the last speaker in one of these uh, occasions, one doesn't really know what will have been said before, so I put everything in I could think of. Uh, but we'll skip through lots of it. Uh, as has been noted, you know, there's a lot of remarkable things in this book. And uh, I have to get my computer woke back up. But anyway, capacity design, which has been claimed to have come from elsewhere, seems to have come out of a, a different source. And you know, the earliest capacity design, as I understand, was written in this book. Meta tells me it came out of other things, though, related to uh, trying to figure out the shear and pre-stressed concrete beams with wheel loads. I, I don't know. Meta will have to tell that story sometime. Uh, but capacity design was there, confinement, uh, beam column joint construction was different from how we ended up with it. But it was, it was there. It was quite interesting. Now, uh, when the book came out, and shortly thereafter, uh, Roland Sharp tells me that SEAC was interested in it, uh, but it was not immediately adopted. It, it wasn't hailed as, a, a, hey, this is the great success, we're going to run with this. There was a lot of suspicion. Uh, some of the big shots of the day, uh, I'm told, including Henry Degenkolb, who was, I think, a steel guy, uh, he made some comments, and others made comments, uh, quote, will double the cost of concrete construction, unquote. Quote, can't be built, unquote. Uh, this must have come a little later. Quote, beam column joints have too much reinforcing, unquote. Uh, quote, uh, designers will need twice as much time to design, unquote. Sound familiar? Every time there's a code change, we hear it. Uh, anyway, as, as a, a result of this, it took a little while for this to be adopted into the, the structural engineer's practice. Uh, lots of discussion, some years. Uh, according to Rolf Sharp, this was really an impetus for doing a lot of the research that we've heard from others uh, here today. Uh, the structural engineers said, you've got to verify that this is going to work and that we need to do this. And so a lot of research got started as a result of this. And so accelerated uh, learning as well as uh, presenting results. Now, uh, the SEAC Blue Book, we've seen this before, the, the notion that you had to have a ductile frame uh, was perhaps one of the drivers. I also had heard the story Meta said about Los Angeles, although I couldn't find it, in fact, uh, as I was doing studies for this presentation. But the 63 Blue Book essentially said it's got to be a steel frame or the equivalent. And so the Bloom Newmark Corning book was quite handy to have uh, if you needed to do it in concrete. By 1965, the Blue Book had pretty much adopted most of what we know about ductile concrete design today. I hate to say it, uh, but it had uh, confined concrete. The properties for the reinforcement were pretty well spelled out. Uh, beam reinforcement ratios, splice locations, anchorage provisions, uh, capacity design for shear web reinforcement was, was all there. Uh, laps had been moved to the mid-height uh, not quite the same as what they were in the BNC book. Uh, joints had pretty much come 
uh, of their own, and uh, column to beam strength ratios by then were introduced. So not everything was in the Bloom Newmark Corning book, but it got a lot of discussion going, and it really moved these things forward. Uh, some proof of this, uh, this is a slide, it was probably a transparency at the time, if you remember what those were, uh, that came out of the uh, SEAC seminar on high-rise design of buildings in 1967. And if you look at the details that are shown in this drawing, it's remarkable. Uh, I would be happy to be in any building designed to this today. In fact, probably happier than most buildings designed today. Uh, because you know, these things were designed and built with care, and everything's there that you really would think that you need, and maybe more of it then than what we put in sometimes today. So by 1967, engineers were learning this, and the field of concrete design had changed on the West Coast forever. Um, I thought I would do a little exercise of what has happened in the American Concrete Institute code practice, so that's this uh, code provisions, uh, then to now. And uh, it's a little tedious, but kind of interesting in some of the detail. The PCA book uh, had confined concrete. Uh, the expression for the area of the hoop, this is probably too small, I apologize. Uh, but if you translate the equations that were in the original book, uh, in essence, the, the expectation was that a rectangular cross-section was only about half as effective for a given volume ratio of confinement as a spiral. They didn't know one way or the other. It was a good guess. Uh, research done since then, the coefficients changed from 0.45 to 0.3. So now we guess that it's about three quarters as effective as a good spiral if it's well detailed. But not much else has changed. Uh, beams. Uh, we saw some of the provisions earlier for beams. Uh, in, by 1983 in the ACI code, uh, we essentially had all the provisions in place that uh, we have today, with the exception that nobody ever imagined that you'd build a special moment frame with beams that are 48 inches deep. Well, now we build them because of the, the heights we're going to and the fact that we concentrate the framing in very few lines. And when you get to a 48 inch deep beam, like the thing on the right, uh, what controls the spacing of the hoops is 12 inches, and it doesn't look good and it doesn't work so well. So there were some changes recently implemented. Uh, beam column joints changed tremendously. Uh, we didn't know back then, and uh, things have changed uh, quite a bit over the years, but really by 1983 we had in place in our ACI code all the same things that we have today, uh, minus a few little details get added here and there. The six-fifths number, I don't know where that came from, uh, other than a guess that the column should be stronger than the beam if you wanted the beam to yield more than the column usually. Some recent studies that I won't show here have been looking at probabilities of collapse for buildings as you vary that strength ratio, and it turns out the turning point is right about 1.2, uh, that the probability of collapse goes way down suddenly. And so you can go to stronger and stronger columns, but you don't get a lot of extra safety out of it. It turns out the sweet spot is right about 1.2 in, in many cases. So there's a little bit of that magic that Terry Perret mentioned. Where did it come from? I don't know. Shear walls, uh, as Sharon uh, talked about and others, changed dramatically. Uh, by 1965, boundary elements were in. Uh, the UBC had them in 1973. ACI had picked them up by 1983. By the way, 1983 is an important date to remember. Uh, by 1995, a different approach had been implemented, which is still current today. Uh, an easy thing to do for a one-minute slide is to count the number of pages in the seismic chapter of the ACI building code. So I counted them. Uh, minus the definitions and uh, the terminology. In 1963, the number of pages was zero. Um, by 1970, it was up to seven, and they were in an appendix, Appendix A. Um, the Sozin years as the chair of ACI 318H started then, and by 1983, that date I mentioned, uh, the uh, code had moved from 
Appendix A into the main body of the, the, the seismic had moved into the main body of the code, which was an important thing to happen. I don't know why, Meta, you doubled the length of the code. What were you thinking? <clears throat> it was now 16 pages long. And now, of course, it's, it's taken off. It's like 48 pages, and I don't know what's going on there. We've got to control sub-H, because it's getting too difficult. It's the chair. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's what's been happening with some of the code provisions. I wanted to mention, though, also, uh, looking forward uh, a bit to where I think some things need to go. Uh, but to do that, I wanted to look back again one more time and uh, look at a couple of photographs on the shaking table. Uh, this is Professor Sozin standing next to uh, a specimen. Uh, kneeling down with his back to us is Professor Otani as a young student. And then kneeling sort of facing us is uh, Polak Gulkan. And uh, I understand from them that uh, this was actually rigged you notice there's no mass on this structure. They, they rigged this because some photographer was coming in uh, or an architecture group and they wanted to show them something. And I remember doing the same thing once uh, with one of my frames. We put a frame up there and it had no lateral bracing and we shook it. And it moved in a plane. We never understood why. We never understood it, but it did exactly what we had hoped. Uh, there were many, many tests done on the University of Illinois shaking table trying to figure out what was going on in the dynamic response of reinforced concrete structure. It wasn't, it, it's kind of easy to think back on it now, but back then it was a big mystery. What's going on? And, and Dr. Sozin really pushed the limits on this to try to figure out what's happening. And one of Meta's uh, axioms really has been, well, if you, if you really want to figure something out, you know, go in the lab and test it because it'll do what it'll do, and you'll have to think about it, and you'll learn something out of that. Uh, and, uh, and each time, something new and interesting came out. Uh, I had to show this because Gustavo insists that this was in a long period in which I hadn't had a haircut. But I, I'm convinced this is right after a haircut. Uh, I'm sure of it. Uh, and Meta can probably confirm some of the things. But this is what some of the structures got to after a while, and they were very useful for what they were used for. Uh, one of the really key things that came out, which I didn't know whether it would be talked about or not, uh, is the notion that strength isn't necessarily what matters in a structure. It, it can be important, but it's not necessarily the most important thing. Uh, and uh, Meta and one of his students, Dan Abrams, did a, a very remarkable experiment in which they had a frame and a wall together. In one wall, they had just two little bars for flexure on the faces. In the other, they had eight bars, you know, four times as strong. And they shook them with almost identical motions, and they got almost identical drift out. It was remarkable. And you know, some 30 years later, I, I, I keep hearing about a test, a full-scale test on the slice of a building in Southern California where they proved the same thing. Uh, but here it is, uh, as a nice demonstration of it. Well, and so Meta was, was always one who was concerned about asking the right questions. And I saw this in the title for his presentation. It's about asking the right questions. I remember one presentation, I think it was in Costa Rica, Maybe, I don't know if Guillermo is here or not at the moment, but I think it was in Costa Rica where Meta presented a slide, something like this, and he says, well, we've got to quit thinking about earthquake engineering as a problem of figuring out what's the force that a beam has to resist. You know, the elastic force divided by an R factor and all. He says, quit worrying about that. What we need to do is think about the earthquake engineering problem is a beam being subjected to an irresistible force and being forced to move to a displacement that you can predict. And that was a, such a clear way to me of, of understanding what earthquake engineering problems had to be about. It was about finding the drift and then working back instead of the other way around. And Meta really gets credit for conceptualizing it in this wonderful way, but also showing that it really worked. And we've used these ideas in some of the developments in the ACI building code. Uh, 
you can call them developments or uh, uh, falling back uh, into uh, excesses. But in the new details that we have for uh, structural walls, they're really determined based on that rule uh, that Meta talks about. You know, it's an equal displacement rule. You know, if you know the elastic displacement, you can estimate what the inelastic displacement is going to be. And if you can estimate that, you can make an estimate of what the detailing needs to be. And that's the basis of what we currently do for structural walls. Uh, and it's, again, a little bit of the magic. There's no reason in the world that I can figure why the inelastic and the elastic displacements should be equal. We call it a rule. It's just an observation and an accident, I think. But it just kind of works out. There must be some physics to it, Terry. But it's magic, I think, yeah. Anyway, we're glad to have it and to know when it doesn't work, because it doesn't always work. Uh, I think going forward, uh, some of the same ideas are going to change the way we think about and the way we detail concrete structures moving forward. Uh, this is one example. This comes from a change proposal that's currently being considered by ACI 318 Subcommittee H, Seismic. And what this looks at is... Uh, the number of tests for confined concrete columns of rectangular cross-section. Uh, we're plotting on the vertical axis the uh, drift ratio, and on the horizontal axis is the amount of transverse steel provided, divided by what the ACI building code currently requires for a special moment frame. And so this vertical line at 1.0 is of some significance. If you're to the right of it, you've got more than the code requires. To the left, you have less. The 3% drift ratio, in a sense, comes out of some of the thinking in the current building code. We permit, I don't know why, but we permit up to 2% drift ratio for multi-story buildings in the design basis earthquake. I wish it was less. I think Meta wishes it was less. Others do. But in the trade wars, we had to keep up with the steel industry, and it ended up, if steel was going there, concrete was going to go there too. So we're at 2% for the design basis. So for an MCE loading, it's something like 3% that we have to worry about. So that's the horizontal line. So these two lines have some significance. The triangles shown here, the open ones are if the axial load is less than 20% of A gross F prime C, the yellow ones we'll put up now are if the axial load goes between 20 and 40 percent. The blue ones, if the axial load goes higher. And the trend is clear, and it's obvious from mechanics. You don't need magic for this one. Uh, it's clear that as the axial force goes up, uh, the amount of transverse steel becomes uh, insufficient in the current code. Now, there's two ways out of this. One is you, you do the sensible thing and you say, well, don't go above a certain axial force. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, in the old codes, there were some limits on axial force that triggered some detailing. We're going to go back to that, it seems, if the change proposal passes. If you stick with a reasonable axial force, um, around 30, 35% of A gross F prime C, what we currently do works just fine. If you're going to go above that, the current proposal on the table is you're going to have to add more steel, and it's going to be hard to figure out how much. Okay, so the idea is to, to discourage the engineer from going into a bad place. I think this is a change that's going to come. It'll change something that's been in place for a long time on how we detail going way back uh, 50 years. Uh, but it's in part based on some of Meta's thinking about bringing displacements into the equation. Uh, another thing I think is going to happen, I'm kind of worried about this. Um, this is a photograph of Christchurch one year after uh, its earthquake. And the yellow rectangles are places where significant buildings are no longer in place. Uh, they design for large displacements and ductilities, and, and I think they got them. In fact, they got them in spades, uh, partly because they got more ground motion than, than they expected. Uh, but it resulted in damage that some people said, well, that's expected. Uh, but it's wiped out a city. And a lot of it's got to do with old construction, but some of it's got to do with new construction performing exactly the way we design it. And I wonder, maybe we ought to think now about backing off on some of the ductility levels and maybe start thinking about new framing systems and materials. Uh, 
And one of them that I think is, is quite fascinating uh, is using different kind of rocking systems. And this is one example that the Tipping Mar in Berkeley is proposing, in fact, building, and in fact, testing uh, in a laboratory with PANCO funding. But the notion is to build in place a reinforced concrete wall with unbonded, post-tensioned uh, uh, strand or uh, steel, and then to add additional uh, steel that's unbonded over a certain length to dissipate some energy, but a self-centering system that has localized damage, controls drift, and uh, I think has a lot of potential. And they've been building some of these, uh, and they are constructible, uh, using some headed steel in this case. Uh, they seem actually uh, to be a simple step in a different direction. And I think we need to be more open to those things going forward, uh, thinking about resilience in our communities and, and sustainability uh, of the cities that we have. I'm going to close on, on this one. Uh, I, I think the book did many important things. You know, it, it, it introduced ideas about displacement-based design, uh, capacity design, uh, notions about sheer strength, uh, in elements, uh, and, and you know, how to lay a system out in a sensible way. It was very important in that regard. Uh, Meta was involved in that. Uh, we may never know exactly how much, but he was, I think, heavily involved in it. And didn't stop there. I mean, he could have stopped at that and, and been famous. Or he could have stopped at two-way slabs and been famous. But you know, he kept doing different things all the time. Uh, but you know, in, in the areas of reinforced concrete construction, demonstrating that things can be built that actually will perform through laboratory tests. It's been very important, and he's been a leader in this area. In addition, the development of analytical modeling techniques that enable engineers, well, initially researchers, to do studies of buildings has been important. But now practicing engineers somewhat routinely are doing nonlinear studies of buildings they're going to design. And a lot of that has to do with early work that Meta did uh, uh, with Takeda and Otani and others. Uh, and so it's incredibly important. Uh, Terry Perrett mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, physics is uh, some magic and some mechanics. You know, Meta's a guy who knows his mechanics surprisingly well. Uh, and uh, also, though, somehow has a bit of the magic. And that's uh, one of the things that is really impressive about him. Uh, and he's also a little humble about some of the great things he's done. But congratulations, Meta.